Well, welcome everybody. I'm very happy to see a, a nice size audience here uh, live at TCU and I hope there are some folks on the internet out there participating also. I see some on the Zoom. No, so far. So um, welcome to the, I want to make sure I get this right, the first annual Professor Frederico and Joanna Xavier Endowed Mathematics Lectureship. I fumbled it at the end there. So uh, this is the first at TCU. I wanted to say a few words about uh, Fred, our recent colleague, uh, who I believe is online there somewhere. So, hi, Fred. Uh, you can find a more detailed uh, bio on uh, the website for the conference. I hope everyone will go check that out. Uh, but just briefly, uh, of course, Fred is originally from Brazil and came to the US to do his PhD at the University of Rochester, uh, which he earned in 1977 under the direction of Richard Levine. Uh, from there, he, uh, he bounced around for a little while, but eventually had a very long and distinguished career at the University of Notre Dame. And then we were very lucky in 2015 to be able to hire him uh, away here at TCU to become our second ever Potter Professor of Mathematics. And uh, he served in that role from 2015 until his retirement in 2021. Uh, he now lives in Miami, uh, but on his way uh, from TCU to Miami, he made a very generous uh, endowment to TCU to host this lectureship series with the goal that over time each year uh, there would, we would do a lecture series to be made available uh, live online to the world. And so we thank Fred for that and we're very excited to kick it off this year. Uh, our speaker uh, for this inaugural event is Mohamed Gomi. Uh, Mohamed earned his PhD in 1998 at Johns Hopkins University under Joel Spruck and he's currently at Georgia Tech. Uh, he's supported by a variety of grants, including an NSF Career Award. And he'll be speaking today on geometric inequalities in spaces of non-positive curvature. Uh, this will be the first of two talks, and I hope you can join us also for the second, which will be at 4.30 Central Time tomorrow. And without anything further, I'll turn it over to Professor Gomi. Thank you very much. Never received the applause before uh, before the talk. So <laughs> yes, it's uh, huh? No, no, I'm uh, yes, yes. The stakes have been uh, risen. Yes. Yeah. So thank you very much for uh, invitation. Uh, it's very nice to be here. My first time in TCU, but everyone is very nice and friendly. And uh, yes. Uh, Actually, I thought I was going to uh, meet Fred. So I always enjoyed meeting him and I was a little, little disappointed when I found out that uh, he's not here, but he's joining remotely together with uh, some other people I know. Uh, yes, so the title is the Geometric Inequalities in Spaces of uh, Non-Positive Curvature. And uh, so more specifically, uh, what do we mean? Um, these are so-called cartan hadamard spaces, and sometimes are just called the Hadamard manifolds. And these are complete, simply connected Riemannian manifolds with uh, non-positive curvature. So the example, of course, is the Euclidean space, which has uh, zero curvature, and the hyperbolic space, which has uh, curvature minus one. So cartan hadamard manifolds is this uh, common framework where uh, you know we can study Euclidean and hyperbolic phenomena at the same time. Uh, so it's diffeomorphic to Rn by the so-called uh, cartan adamar theorem, which states that the exponential map is a uh, diffeomorphism. Uh, so every pair of points can be connected by a unique geodesic. And that means that uh, defining convex sets uh, is very simple. It's it's the same exact definition in Euclidean space. A set is convex if it contains the geodesic segment between any pair of its uh, points. Uh, well, non-positive curvature, I mean, you know, if you want to find non-positive curvature in terms of uh, Riemann tensor, it's very complex and uh, takes a course. Uh, <laughs> however, uh, uh, you know, there's this uh, you know, excellent way of thinking about it uh, synthetically, and it gives you all the information that uh, you need. So the curvature is uh, non-positive if the exponential map is expansive, 
And so you don't even need to know what an exponential map is. Uh, so non-positiveness of the curvature means that uh, you just take a point in your manifold <coughs> and you look at the pair of uh, geodesics coming out of it. Then uh, you take a pair of points on these geodesics, X and Y, and uh, rescale by a lambda. So if we are in uh, Euclidean space, when you compare the distances, when you scale by lambda, the distances exactly you scale by lambda. Uh, so it's just completely linear. But here you get this inequality. And uh, this is exactly equivalent to having a non-positive curvature. Uh, and of course, this is valid for more general uh, Alexandra type spaces. So in particular, something that follows is that if you have a sphere in this space, and then you uh, rescale it by lambda at the origin. So if the length rescales by lambda, then the surface area is going to rescale by lambda to the n minus one. I always use this absolute value symbols for uh, surface area for uh, volume. Uh, so using this, you can uh, quickly show that balls in cotton have more manifold satisfy the Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. So uh, what is that? Euclidean isoperimetric inequality actually is something that uh, uh, you can pose in uh, any space. So uh, you have some domain in your space with the boundary S and you compare it with Euclidean domain with the same boundary, and uh, we say the isoperimetric inequality holds whenever you compare it to a region with the same boundary, or with the ball actually, then, uh, then, uh, so I guess I, actually I don't see that here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so well, that's right. So, so when the uh, surface areas are the same, uh, the uh, the volume cannot beat the Euclidean volume. Okay, so that's that's what we mean that uh, uh, your space is not more efficient than the Euclidean space itself. Okay, that's what we mean by uh, Euclidean isoperimetric inequality. So it's a comparison result. Uh, so you can quickly prove just using the synthetic definition of curvature that the balls satisfy the isoperimetric inequality in these cotton hardware manifolds. So take your ball, so M here is the cotton hardware manifold, and then you can uh, look at the rescalings of a center, center at the origin, so S of T. And uh, this is uh, your corresponding ball in the Euclidean space with the same surface area, and it's easy to show that uh, this radius is going to be uh, less than or equal to the other radius. That part of it is easy, so now uh, look at the surface area of these uh, vibrations, these centric uh, spheres. So uh, this, by definition, is just uh, this is how much exactly you have to be scale. So by definition, is this, and it's uh, less than this by the definition of uh, curvature I just uh, uh, stated. Uh, and then uh, you get this inequality because uh, S and S we. Uh, S and S tilde, we assume that they have the same surface area that uh, you can be right. And this is that, and, and then you get this comparison then between the uh, uh, concentric spheres there and concentric spheres here that uh, those, are, those ones have less area than this. And so you just plug it all in the volume of the ball. You can compute the volume of the ball by integrating over the level sets. That's just the co-area formula. So if all the level sets, uh, their area compares it this way, then you have proved your uh, isoperimetric inequality. So here's the uh, uh, complete proof of the isoperimetric inequality for balls and cotton hardware space. Uh, so step two, try to uh, prove it in general for regions uh, that are uh, not the ball. Uh, and if you're interested to do that, then uh, one good exercise would be uh, just start with the convex ones. So uh, why wouldn't this prove that we just uh, outline 
uh, work for uh, convex bodies because actually this uh, isoperimetric inequality in carter hamlin manifold is open even for the convex regions even. So this proof that I stated, why do you think it wouldn't work for, I took some liberties of course, because this is a uh, sphere. And uh, one reason is that uh, if you look at the inner parallel surface at the distance T in the sphere is the same as rescaling. Okay, and that's something that you don't have in other uh, convex bodies. Okay, so so we have this uh, cotton handle conjecture dates back. It, it uh, stated by several people starting in 1970s by Oban, Gromov, uh, Borogo, at Galler. Oban, I guess, was the first one who stated it. Oban actually was interested in Sobolev inequalities. I suppose I inequality. Uh, is that the intersection of so many things in the geometric analysis, in particular, it's uh, equivalent to Sobolev inequality. And uh, so people naturally wanted to generalize that to Riemannian manifold. That was the point of view of uh, Ben. So the general conjecture says that uh, you have this domain in your uh, Cartan-Ramon space, and then you compare it with a ball in the Euclidean space with the uh, same surface area. And then you want to show that the volume cannot be the volume of the ball. Uh, equivalent formulation is as this uh, ratio. So uh, you raise the volume to n minus one, you divide by the perimeter to the n, and that ratio uh, is always maximized by balls in uh, Euclidean space. So it's known for uh, hyperbolic space. If you have constant curvature by uh, Steiner symmetrization, actually I'm going to uh, I'll tell you or remind you what that is. For n equals two, it was established by Andre Vey in the 1920s. It was actually uh, Andre Vey's uh, first paper. So he was a student in Hadmar's famous uh, seminars in Paris. And uh, one day, Paul Levy happened to be visiting famous uh, probabilist and also a former student of uh, Hadamar. And he mentions during his seminar, I said, well, you all know about the isoperimetric inequality in the plane. Uh, that would it hold uh, in a plane with uh, negative curvature? So probabilists have always been interested in isoperimetric inequality, by, but why did he ask uh, negative curvature? Why not positive curvature? So if you have a positive curvature, then the uh, isoperimetric inequality uh, is not going to hold in positive curvature because uh, this, uh, you see, this is a disk in the plane, and this is a positive curve region with uh, the same boundary, but it has uh, more area. Uh, so for positive, it's not going to happen. So then you ask the question for non-negative, and uh, Sondre Vey uh, then uh, didn't take him long to. Uh, solve it. It's a, it's a short paper. He uses the Riemann mapping theorem and conformal coordinates. If you uh, write the uh, area uh, and uh, length in conformal coordinates using uh, Riemann mapping, where you just parameters everything using the disk, then it just uh, uh, pops out very quickly. Uh, for n equals three, it was by uh, Kleiner using an estimate for the total gas Kronecker curvature. And this is the method that uh, we just wrote to study that extensively and uh, mentioned something about it later. For n equals four, it was done by Chris Croke using an inequality of Santalo, but uh, that seems to be quite accidental. There is this inequality of Santalo that gives you some constant in every dimension. And for some reason, that constant is uh, sharp dimension four. It just seems to be uh, accidental. I, it doesn't seem that uh, Croke's method uh, can be generalized to other dimensions, but Kleiner is something that we spend a lot of time on. Uh, it's been proved for large volumes, if you assume that the curvature is uh, strictly negative. And for vo large volumes, actually, it follows very quickly. Uh, Yao and Baragos Zagaler uh, figured that out. It uh, follows for uh, small volumes. For small volumes, it also holds, although the proof of that is a lot more complicated. And also for every n, you can find a constant so that uh, it holds up to a constant uh, in every dimension, and that's due to work of uh, Sprock and Hoffman. 
Uh, as I said, the isoparametric inequality is uh, equivalent to the classical subalike inequality, where you have a function and you compare its integral to the integral of the norm of its uh, gradient. Uh, this is equivalent to the isoparametric inequality via the co area formula, as a quick proof. Uh, as I said, it's open even in the convex case. So, uh, Convexity will be a major theme of both my talk uh, today and my talk tomorrow. Convexity you know, is ubiquitous in mathematics and uh, it's so useful. But you know, when you think about it, why is convexity so useful? Well, you know, one reason is that it's linear. You're looking at the lines, right, in your set. And you know what those lines are? You have like so much structure. If you take the convex one of the finite number of points, it's a, a simplicial uh, object. All of these things uh, go out of the window when you move to the Riemannian world. And some very basic questions about convexity become very complicated or even uh, remain unknown. So as I said, uh, it doesn't hold in space of positive curvature. Uh, okay, now before um, to tell you how to uh, study this question in space of non-positive curvature, I guess it's useful to just uh, look at, uh, you know, for the sake of completeness, a couple of uh, uh, proofs of isoparametric inequality. I mean, you know, there are so many different ways of proving that, that has been compiled uh, over generations. And every cardinal hadamard mantle is a Euclidean space. So one of these proofs should generalize, or other way, or if you look at it the other way, if you, if you prove the uh, this fact in carbon had no space, it means that you've also found a, a new proof of the isoparametric inequality in the Euclidean space that had not been noted. So uh, one basic proof of uh, Steiner is this uh, Steiner symmetrization. There are various symmetrization methods some due to Schwartz. Steiner symmetrization is very famous. If you have a domain, uh, it needs not be convex or even simply connected. You vibrate it. You take a hyper, this, this works in any dimension. You take a, a hyperplane, and you look at all the lines orthogonal to it, and then they're going to fibrate your region into segments. You locate the midpoint of all segments, you move them down. And this makes it uh, symmetric with respect to the plane. So uh, you start by uh, assuming, but Steiner assumed that uh, minimizer exists. If you assume that uh, minimizer of perimeter exists for a given volume, then this operation shows that uh, minimizer must be symmetric. With, every, with respect to every plane and therefore be a, a sphere. Uh, one catch that didn't bother Steiner himself was that, uh, well, how do you know that uh, minimizer exists? That uh, the existence of a uh, uh, surface area minimizer for a given uh, volume uh, is not trivial. So even in R3, you know, you can have uh, uh, these, uh, these uh, regions bounding a, a given volume, but they're just going to get uh, longer and longer and uh, degenerate into a line. And nevertheless, proving the existence of a minimizer is not difficult. Uh, you use the so-called uh, flash case selection principle and you, solve it, uh, and you do an exhaustion of your space. You look at this uh, uh, minimizers in uh, kind of big balls and you let the ball run to uh, infinity. But, uh, uh, and even kind of more simple way, I guess you could call it brown minkowski inequality. This one doesn't even um, require the uh, existence argument. Uh, this is probably uh, the neatest, quickest proof of the isoparametric inequality. Uh, it's, uh, it states that if you have uh, two regions and you put in space, then you can add them. And add the, adding them means that uh, you look at the points in each as vectors and you add them as vectors. So you get the new region. And the inequality is that uh, the sum of the volumes to the one n is going to be bigger than the individual volumes to the one n. Now, how do you prove Brown and Kowski? Well, for uh, cubes, it's uh, trivial. Here's the proof for uh, cubes. <laughs> for cubes. For cubes, just follows quickly. Uh, once you can prove it for cubes, then you can prove it for any region by approximation. So it, it, it can actually be done in just uh, one page. And uh, once you have the Brun-Minkowski inequality, 
then uh, given the domain, uh, you do this derivation. You go up by a constant distance. Going up by a constant distance r is the same as adding the ball of radius r uh, at each point. This also makes sense to note that in any actually metrics, because you just look at the set of points within a distance of r. So now if you uh, apply the uh, ruhn minkowski uh, inequality to the volume of the outer body, uh, so here's the inequality, right? And uh, so these are just the first few terms, the binomial. And so what's the surface area? Surface area is the first, first variation of volume. So you subtract that in there and uh, you get the yes, perfect inequality expression that I had uh, written earlier. Okay, so it works really, uh, yeah, I think this is the simplest. This is really the simplest proof and it works in all dimensions of Euclidean space. Uh, okay, so why wouldn't this work in Riemannian manifolds? Well, so this is kind of a variational technique. Uh, you go out there by a certain distance and then you compare your volume to the original volume and uh, the reason it doesn't work in uh, Riemannian manifolds uh, is that uh, the formulas that we have for the variation of uh, volume and length are more complicated, as I will show you. They don't work uh, as easily as this. Uh, okay, so convexity is important, right? In all optimization problems and isoparametric inequality, there is no more basic, uh, right? This is the oldest optimization problem. Actually, if people here are interested in history, uh, it, it's mentioned by the Roman poet uh, Virgil in Aeneid mm -hmm. about the story of founding of the uh, city of uh, Carthage by uh, Queen Dido. So you can, uh, you can Google that. Uh, I don't want to go through that again. I, uh, I remember the first time I talked about uh, this topic. Uh, I, uh, yes, I started with the story of uh, Queen Dido. And uh, I remember after my drill strike told me that, okay, when I'm going to give a talk on isolated inequality, I'm not going to mention Queen Dido. So, uh, okay, so I'm just mentioning it in the middle now, as opposed to the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so, so there are similarities with uh, Rn. Uh, one similarity is that uh, the distance function from a convex set is itself going to be a convex function. So what's the meaning of a convex function on a Riemannian manifold? A function being convex on a Riemannian manifold, it means that whenever you restrict your function to a geodesic parameterized by arc length, then that function is convex, okay? Which is actually the uh, direct generalization of what happens in uh, Euclidean space. So the distance function from a convex set is convex, which is very good. Uh, it turns out that uh, convex sets actually have uh, dimension. This is proved by, uh, uh, Chiga, it's in Chigar Ibn's book on comparison uh, geometry. So it means that every convex set is uh, contained in a so-called totally geodesic uh, uh, submanifold. So totally geodesic submanifolds in the Riemannian space, these are analogs of uh, planes and subspaces of uh, Euclidean space. But there are uh, important differences from Euclidean space, some extremely surprising ones. So this is uh, particularly annoying. And this kind of kills uh, uh, attempts to do uh, induction or polygonal approximation. A lot of results in Euclidean space you can do by polygonal approximation. So you have your region, and then you take a finite number of points, and then you take the convex hall, and you use that as an approximation. But uh, in a general carbon handle manifold, uh, you cannot even uh, describe, it's not clear what the structure of a convex hull of three points is. So if you, if you pick two points and you take a convex hull, that's just a geodesic. But take three points, right? If I take convex hull of three points in uh, Euclidean space, I just get a triangle. There is no interior. But if you take the convex hull of two points in carbon handle manifold, it may have interior, of, regardless of the dimension. There is, an, you know, there is no uh, simplicial structure. Wait, yeah. Including space. You got a triangle. Yeah, but including the interior, right? Yeah, I, I meant like in R3. Right. In, uh, I mean, interior with respect to the ambient space. I mean, 
You wanna you wanna have a baller oh, full? Oh, oh I yes. see what you mean. That's right. I, I, so full dimension. Full dimension. Full dimension. Right. Exactly. Exactly. That's right. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, feel free to uh, interrupt me at any time. Uh, okay, so uh, yes, but then what happens is the, the distance function is convex on the interior, but then another uh, particular annoying thing that happens is that the, if you look at the sine distance function, so you just look at the distance function from the interior whenever you're outside, you know, it's with uh, positive one multiplicative factor, but when you're inside, you multiply by minus one. So you get this function, which is globally defined on your uh, manifold. When you're in your Euclidean space, this function is convex everywhere. But unfortunately, in a cotton hardware manifold, it's not going to be convex in the interior. What are some other strange things? So, so a subtitle for this talk could be uh, how to prove the cotton hardware conjecture, uh, and uh, especially uh, not to fall into the common pitfalls. And uh, so another uh, phenomenon here, and this is actually a very recent paper of uh, Lichak and uh, Petrone that, that came out, I think just uh, within a year ago, that also uh, resolves one of these uh, very common misconceptions about cotton hardmark uh, manifold. So if you look at the boundary of the convex hole of a set, uh, it may not contain any geodesic uh, segment, which is very strange. Uh, you know, if you take, for instance, you know, Four points in three space, and look at the convex hull, it's a tetrahedron. So if you look at the boundary, any point on the boundary is going to lie in the middle of a large set. Not so in a uh, Riemannian manifold. So you don't have no paratheodority. See, paratheodority the theorem says that any point in the convex hull of a finite number of points can be written as a convex combination of these points. All of that goes out of the window. As I said, there is no simplicial uh, structure. <clears throat> Uh, and then another thing that happens is that uh, so yes, taking your definition of convex hull is the intersection of all convex. Uh, That's right. The, 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 yes, yes, uh, yes. Good question. The definition of convex hull is the same as the definition in Euclidean place. Namely, it's the smallest convex set which contains your given set, or the intersection of all the convex sets that contain your uh, given set. But it's not the union of all the geodesics. Uh, well, uh, no, it? actually, actually, that also holds as well. This is the statement only for points on the boundary. Uh, so another thing that's true, one way you can generate the convex hull is that uh, you look at all the geodesics between the points that you get at, and then you take pair of points between these geodesics, and you connect those, and then you continue to go, and you take the union all of all that. That still uh, remains true in the Riemannian world, but uh, nevertheless, uh, the boundary fails to have any geodesic on it. Yeah, it's very, very strange. Uh, then another thing that happens is that, you know, convexity has many equivalent formulations in uh, Euclidean space. And the fact that these are equivalent is a very important tool. But then uh, when you go to a Riemannian manifold, particularly part and half mod space, all these equivalent things diverge and you get like a hierarchy of notions of convexity. Uh, so, so convex, you already uh, defined it means that the geodesic is in the set. Then there's this other class of uh, objects, D convex. This means that the distance function from the boundary is convex inside the set. And these are a strictly smaller group. And then a subset of that are so-called H convex. H convex means that through each boundary point, there passes a horosphere. So what's a horosphere? If you have a point on your manifold, uh, you can look at the sphere goes through it. Uh, let's say you pick a ray, and at each point on this ray, you look at the uh, sphere centered on that, and you take this, you take the limit to go to infinity, and then you obtain the so-called uh, hollow sphere. And uh, right, so hollow spheres are generalizations of planes, and um, and you put in space uh, each convex and convex are the same. Uh, same thing if you have a convex set, and then you take the intersection of uh, intersection of all half spaces determined by support planes to get the same thing. However, not so in uh, Carton Hadamard. Actually, not even so on the hyperbolic plane. Uh, so what? So these are some examples which illustrate that these are different notions. So, for instance, uh, in the hyperbolic, this is the Poincaré disk, 
uh, and these are a pair of uh, geodesics. Look at the region in between. This turns out to be convex, but the distance from the uh, distance function from the boundary is not convex. You can take another example. Uh, you can look at this uh, infinite geodesic, and this is a tube of constant distance from this uh, geodesic because the distance function is convex on the outside. This will be a uh, convex object. And it's B convex, but it's not the H convex. You see, to be an H convex, there has to be a horosphere going uh, through each part. And the horospheres are just the circles to the boundary. So, for instance, at this point, you see, you can draw a circle which uh, supports it. Okay, so, okay, so enough bad news, uh, but uh, <laughs> let's also uh, say something uh, positive. So how are we gonna study the isoparametric and uh, uh, carton Hadwa manifolds despite all the kind of all the complications that happen uh, with regard to uh, convexity? Well, so we can uh, try to adopt a variational approach, right? Just like the uh, the Bruno Minkowski proof, right? You go out the distance r and then you try to study how the volume uh, changes. And then, uh, right, this is the classical uh, Steiner polynomial. Uh, and uh, that's the thing that we try to understand and uh, uh, generalize. Uh, and then, then again, one can find this analog. So I'm going to explain all these things. So uh, in Euclidean space, if you have an object and you got a distance r, you get a new object, uh, it's volume and surface area. These are given by polynomials in, uh, in r, and it's of degree n, where n is the dimension of your space. And then the coefficients are very significant. The coefficients uh, correspond to so-called various total uh, mean curvature. Um, so these are very well developed in Euclidean space. But then again, the challenge is to uh, generalize them to the Riemannian world, particularly the uh, carton hadamard setting. So, uh, right, so uh, I'll, I'm, I'm going to actually prove the Steiner formula here. But, uh, you know, what's the kind of very basic situation, right? If you have a, a square in R2, let's say, and then uh, you go out a certain distance R, and then um, then you obtain this new perimeter, right? What's the size of the perimeter? The, the size of the perimeter is uh, these uh, straight lines. So this is just the, your uh, old boundary. And then you get uh, four semicircles that you connect, you get two pi r. So you obtain a uh, polynomial of uh, degree one. And uh, so the two pi r turns out to be the total gas corner per curvature of this body. Now, if you do it uh, for uh, cubes, uh, it gets a little bit more complicated. You got by distance r, so uh, each of these squares moves up, and so you have the, you have your perimeter, and then uh, around each of the edges, you get a cylindrical portion. Uh, so this will be the coefficient of r. Uh, it depends on r and then the dihedral angles. This is the discrete analog of the total mean curvature. And then you will have an R squared term. R squared term is for these uh, spherical regions around uh, each vertex. So you obtain a poly uh, polynomial of uh, degree two. It's kind of very intuitive and visual. Uh, in general, actually, the proof of it is very simple uh, for uh, smooth objects. So if you have a hypersurface and you put in space, uh, gamma, and uh, you choose this uh, normal to add new, and then you go out by distance t. Uh, this, this will always be well defined for a small t if your surface is uh, C11. And uh, so Steiner's formula says that you obtain this uh, polynomial of uh, degree n minus one. You can write it both for volume and surface area. If you write it for volume, then it will be degree n for surface area is the derivative of that. So you get something of degree uh, n minus one. And these coefficients are important. These coefficients turn out to be the so-called generalized mean curvature. The first one is called the total mean curvature. The last one is the so-called uh, gas Kronecker curvature. So 
So what are these things? Uh, so we take our uh, principal curvature, right? What's the principal curvature? Any uh, hypersurface in Euclidean space, you can locally represent it as the graph of a function, the high function. And uh, you take the Hessian of that. The Hessian is symmetric, so it's diagonalizable. These principal curvatures are the eigenvalues of the Hessian. And you take the trace of that matrix, that gives you the mean curvature. You take the determinant, that gives you the so-called gauss kronecker curvature. You look at the various symmetric functions that uh, you know, go from the trace to the determinant. And these are the so-called generalized uh, mean curvatures. So these are, the, so these are just uh, elementary symmetric functions of the eigenvalues of the Hessian. And the first one you said, uh, the zeroth one is said equal to one by definition. So, uh, so the zeroth, the zeroth one, you see the coefficient here, the first coefficient here is, uh, is just gamma. So the zeroth one will just give you the surface area. Uh, now, so actually the proof of standard polynomial is very simple in the context of uh, differential geometry. Uh, you can map your surface to the outer parallel surface by just going distance of t along the normals. Then you take the differential of that, the Jacobian. You're going to get the identity matrix plus t times the differential of the Gauss map. The differential of the Gauss map is called the shape operator, yes? And uh, the principal curvatures are just the eigenvalues of the shape operator. So uh, if you want to uh, find the volume, you just, uh, this is the Jacobian, right? You integrate the Jacobian, it's a determinant of the differential. And so it's a determinant of I plus uh, TDB. And you know what to do with that, right? It, it gives you the characteristic polynomial of the shape operator. And what are the coefficients in the characteristic polynomial? They're exactly symmetric functions of the eigenvalues. So this is the proof of the uh, Steiner's formula. It works in uh, every dimension. It really works really nicely in Euclidean space. Uh, there is uh, another uh, formula for uh, these uh, due to Crofter. This is kind of uh, more global, it's integral geometric. So it turns out that these uh, total mean curvatures, uh, what you do is that uh, you look at the Grassmannian manifold of your subspaces. And then you uh, project uh, your uh, hypersurface in all these directions, you know, so for various dimensions. So you can be projecting into hyperplanes, you can be projecting into lines, and then you measure the size of that, and then you integrate that over the uh, entire Grassmannian, and there will be some uh, normalizing constants. So these are actually average size of uh, projections in every direction. And uh, so the n minus two one, it turns out is the mean width because this one you project in every direction into line and then you measure the separation distance and then you average. So that one is famous uh, m minus one by definition, you define that to be the uh, surface area. So one good use of uh, Crofton's formula is that it immediately gives you this monotonicity, uh, which is very important that uh, if you have a uh, uh, region contained inside another region, then all these generalized mean curvatures are uh, monotonic. Monotonicity is always such an uh, important thing to have in uh, variational problems. And if you notice, I said that with the sign because uh, it's one of the things that also going to fail in uh, Riemannian manifolds uh, for some of these R's. But uh, soon I'll show you that actually for uh, some of these R's, the monotonicity holds and uh, it's, it's quite helpful. So the alexander fenchel inequalities uh, tell us how these uh, coefficients, and by the way, these are also known as uh, Kerr mass integrals or uh, mixed volumes. Uh, they all compare very nicely with the corresponding uh, inequalities for the sphere in Euclidean space. Uh, so, this, you can think of it as a kind of very deep generalization of the isoperimetric inequality. And this Alexander Pencil inequality itself contains so many things. So for the right coefficients, right? So here you have these variables. Uh, N is the dimension, but then you have these other two exponents there, K and R. And for the right uh, combination of these, it gives you the isoperimetric inequality. Uh, it gives you the 
famous Minkowski inequality. So Minkowski inequality says that the non convex surface surfaces with the same area, uh, sphere, and only sphere, minimizes the total mean curvature. And this is actually something that uh, Minkowski used to uh, produce uh, one of the nicer proofs of the isopermetic inequality. So in, uh, this is the famous formula of Minkowski. Uh, in three-dimensional space, the total mean curvature is bounded below by that uh, quantity, and this is sharp. Uh, so, this, so these are all consequences of the Alexander of uh, For the, um, the n minus one, this corresponds to the total gas Kronecker curvature, and Alexander of says that uh, this is bigger than the surface area of the sphere in that dimension. But you see, in uh, Euclidean space, this is such an intuitive thing because remember, what's the Gauss corner curvature? It's the determinant of the differential of the Gauss map. The Gauss map goes from your surface to the unit sphere because we have a parallel translation in Euclidean space. So when you integrate the Jacobian of that, uh, what do you get? You get the total volume of the image. But if you have a, a convex surface in Euclidean space, there is a normal pointing to every direction. So this is just simply a consequence of the fact that the Gauss map is on to. Uh, okay, so again, with another sigh, unfortunately, <laughs> <laughs> it's not going to be uh, so easy in uh, cartan Aldermann space. In fact, it turns out and this was uh, the method used by uh, Kleiner, which uh, Joe Sprock and I would uh, study in greater details. All these papers, by the way, are uh, on our website. Uh, just proving this fact, proving that the total gas particle curvature is bounded below by the surface area of the sphere uh, is an open question. And if you could just demonstrate this in a carton hadron manifold, that will solve the carton hadron Okay, so, okay, so Cardan has one of manifolds. Okay, so, so, every, so this was actually, we were just looking at the Euclidean space, right? That's why we have, you know, so much information. Now. So, okay, now what happens in a Cardan has space? In a Cardan has space, uh, standard polynomial holds, but uh, not with equality. You have an inequality, okay? So, it already weakens it. The Alexander Fenchel inequalities that I uh, showed, uh, they have been extended to hyperbolic space using this uh, harmonic mean curvature flow, but they, all, they haven't always happened in their uh, sharpest form. So curvature flows you know, have been very powerful in recent years in uh, geometric analysis. Uh, mean curvature flow is maybe the most famous. It turns out that if you have a convex surface in a carton handle manifold, and uh, so if you have a convex surface in Euclidean space and you evolve it by the mean curvature flow, so you move along the dimension of the normal, but not the constant speed, with speed given by the mean curvature. So it's a well-known result that uh, if you do that to a convex surface in uh, Euclidean space, it shrinks it and then makes it more round at the same time. Then it converges to a ball. And uh, throughout this deformation, you have various beautiful monotonicity properties, everything evolves. So whenever you want to compare something with a sphere, this is a wonderfully uh, efficient way of uh, doing that. And it's just giving you know, all kinds of results. Uh, in a carton Hadamard space, first of all, the main character flow fails. So it's not even gonna exist for all time. It develops all kinds of singularities. There's this other thing called harmonic curvature flow. So in the harmonic curvature flow, we look at the harmonic mean of the principal curvatures, not just uh, you know, their sum. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very nice result that uh, if you look at the harmonic mean curvature flow, it preserves convexity and that makes it round in the limits. But then we don't have these uh, various monotonicity properties. It's not clear uh, what it does, for instance, to the gas curvature, right? So I showed you that if you can show that the gas curvature is bigger than the gas curvature of the sphere in your duct. 
and uh, the harmonic flow is a very natural transformation from arbitrary convex bodies to the round sphere. But is the gas coverage required to change monotonically? So no one, uh, no one knows that. Uh, okay. Sharp Minkowski inequality is not known even in a three-dimensional hyperbolic space. That's the theorem I just showed you about the total mean curvature being optimized for the spheres. It's not known. Almost all fundamental questions are open in CH manifold. I supermetric inequality open. Total gas curvature bounded by the sphere is open. Oh, and a particularly embarrassing confession. Uh, <laughs> not only we can show that it's bounded below by the area of the sphere, we can even show that it's bounded below by an epsilon, positive epsilon. Uh, uh, okay, so if you can just find the lower bound of, you know, 0. 0.00001, actually, I think that'll be actually quite secure. Um, intensity inequality is open. Uh, but actually, with, with one of my results with uh, Joel Sprock, uh, we did actually solve it in uh, dimension uh, three using the harmonic mean curvature flow. So the total gas perfect curvature inequality by this. Uh, idea that Kleiner showed. So there's this function called the isoparametric profile. So in any space, uh, you take a given volume and then uh, you measure the least perimeter and closing that volume, it gives you a function. If you differentiate that function, you get the mean curvature. So it's a derivative of the isoparametric profile. To prove the isoparametric inequality means that you need to take the isoparametric uh, profile of the carbon handle manifold and compare it to the isoparametric profile in a Euclidean space. Uh, as I said, when you differentiate the isoparametric profile, you get the mean curvature. So you need uh, some estimate for the mean curvature. But uh, remember, the mean curvature is the arithmetic mean of principal curvatures. And the gas particle curvature is the geometric mean. And then we have the relationship between the arithmetic mean and the geometric mean. So that's why if you can estimate the gas particle curvature, okay, that will solve the uh, carton hadmal conjecture. Warning, more strange convexity phenomena. Uh, monotonicity fails, even for the gas Kronecker curvature. This is, uh, this is really sad. Uh, <laughs> So, of course, uh, monotonicity holds in Euclidean space, right? Because the total gas particle curvature is constant. It's just the volume of the unit sphere, right? So, for trivial reason, you have it's a constant function. In particular, it's monotonic. In a uh, carbon halide manifold, it turns out that uh, you can construct a uh, convex surface, and uh, there is a uh, smaller one inside. But that smaller one is actually going to have bigger total uh, gas particle uh, curvature. And this is very surprising. Uh, it was proved by a uh, Russian mathematician work in California, Dexter, and published in JDG in 1981. Uh, you would assume that it's a kind of a well-known journal, you know? And yet uh, uh, the first time it was ever cited was in my uh, paper just uh, two, three years ago with uh, Charles <laughs> And uh, you know, it's an incredible counter example. So what he does is that uh, uh, he looks at H2 as a subset of H. Uh, so he looks at a uh, warp product of uh, H2s, right? So he, he takes these uh, hyperbolic uh, uh, planes, and then he takes the cross product, but then he scales the metric. Okay, so it's a uh, it's a warp product, and then he puts a, a disk in H2. And of course, you know, the, there is a precise rate how the curvature gets rescaled as you, as you move up. And then he takes uh, this disk, and then he just constructs a cone. And, and this disk, you can actually think of it as a three-dimensional object if you inflate it a little bit into a pill. So that's your original convex body. And then he looks at the cone. Also, you can inflate the cone a little bit by epsilon. So this is uh, contained in that. But this is going to have more curvature. And uh, yes, so I mean, 
So one reason this is bad, because you see, this is the simplest way. If you have an uh, object content inside another one, right? The most simple way that you can con maybe conceive of comparing them is that way. You just take a point and you just take a convex hump, right? You just go out just like one convex hump at a, at a time. This is like how we compare a, a convex polytope uh, content inside the other one. But this shows that even the most simple um, kind of the formation that you can think of, just take, taking a convex hull of a one point with your original object uh, fails. Um, okay, another surprising phenomenon is that the total mean curvature in uh, H3, the hyperbolic space is not uh, minimized by spheres. So remember Minkowski had showed that uh, minimizer is uh, spheres in Euclidean space. Not so, uh, counter example is due to Navera Solanus. This was actually a question of Santa Law at some point. And there too, this, uh, this done uh, pill-shaped object uh, beats the sphere, has a smaller total mean curvature than the sphere. Uh, okay, let's see, how long is my talk? I have a lot. I have a lot of stuff to say, but I don't uh, feel rushed because I also have another day. If if you guys uh, show up again, yeah, until five. So. Yeah. Is it an hour or is it fifty minutes? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. So I go. I go an hour. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um. Okay. So uh, I I uh, told you how. Uh, the estimate for the gas quark curvature would imply the isoperimetric inequality uh, that uh, Kleiner had um, originally figured out. It turns out that actually Minkowski inequality also implies the isoperimetric inequality. So the Minkowski inequality, remember, it gives you, it tells you the, the one in the finished space tells you that if you look at the total mean curvature for a convex body, it's uh, minimized by a sphere of the same area. Okay. You can only compare when to objects of the same area. And so if, if uh, somebody can establish the Minkowski inequality, then the uh, carton hadamard would uh, follow. Uh, so, uh, and so this is, uh, yes. So uh, actually, so the proof of this is in one of the papers with uh, Sprock that, um, getting an estimate for the gas quark, curva, gas quark curvature is not the only way. If you can also estimate the mean curvature, that gives you uh, another way of doing that. And uh, this is actually a good thing because um, as I show you if I have time, uh, it turns out that uh, total mean curvature is actually monotonic. So this crazy example of Dexter that uh, ruins everything when you want to get an estimate for the total gas quark curvature, that doesn't happen for total mean curvature. If you have a convex body and then you have another convex body inside, the total mean curvature always changes uh, monotonically. And uh, okay, so let's see, maybe I throw in a proof here. Uh, yeah, the proof is a little bit, I mean, the proof is simple, but not simple enough that I can uh, state it in a few minutes, but uh, I'll just give you the ingredients. So, well, it uses the notion of, uh, so, so I wanna show that if you have this estimate, uh, uh, I wanna show that if you can prove the Minkowski inequality, that the total mean curvature is bigger than total mean curvature of the sphere of the same area. If you can prove this, it implies the isotopic inequality. So this is what I wanna prove. And uh, so the basic ingredients of the proof, is that, well, we have this notion of uh, reach by a uh, Federer. So the reach of a convex surface is the supremum of the radii of balls that uh, roll freely inside. Uh, another way to uh, define the reach is that you look at the distance function inside, and uh, these are the set of uh, singularities. So for instance, if, you're, uh, if you just look at an ellipse, the set of uh, singularities of the distance function is uh, this line which is called uh, medial axis. It's actually, it's different from the line that, that connect the foci. This is a different thing. And this is, uh, well, Romani Germans call it the uh, Pat Locus. That's uh, because if you start coming from the geodesics from the boundary, 
uh, this is the first, uh, this is the locus of points where the geodesics will uh, start uh, intersecting. So the ridge is the distance between the boundary and the cut locus. And uh, so something happens when you uh, uh, look at the comparison between inner and outer parallel bodies. So if, if you go inside the distance, which is smaller than the reach, then you go back up, you get the exact same surface that you have. But if you go further than the reach, so like here, you went too far, and here, when you hit the reach, you uh, lose the smallness, then when you come back, you get a, a smaller area. And this is the gist of the proof uh, that uh, Minkowski inequality implies the stupid inequality via the area formula. So uh, for area formula, what does it say? It says that if you take a Lipschitz function on your region, uh, and if the gradient is one, here the gradient will be one because we're looking at the distance function. The gradient of the distance function is always uh, one. So then the volume of your region is uh, the same as uh, integral of the level six of the distance function. And the nice thing is that this formula holds even when your level sets have uh, singularities because uh, it's, it's, well not, it's not that instead of singularities have measure zero, they're not going to uh, mess up this uh, integral. So, um, right, so, to, so, so the basic idea is that uh, this is your uh, region, you look at this uh, level sets, you compare them with the corresponding level sets uh, for the sphere. And uh, if the Minkowski inequality holds, you can compare these level sets, okay? Once you can compare these level sets, then you can uh, integrate, you have this thing, and you integrate. And uh, as I said, it's, it's very simple, but it just takes a little bit of time. And uh, I think uh, uh, maybe tomorrow I can go into more details. Uh, about that, but uh, let's see. The <clears throat> last few minutes that I have, what is it that I want to mention? Okay, so uh, questions. Can one prove? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so actually, this actually gives you an annular uh, isoparametric inequality because uh, uh, actually it actually gives you a comparison between. Uh, these domains of region thickness with the same regions of the same thickness, and then you end up with the so-called uh, bonus and isoparametric inequality. Bonus and isoparametric inequality is a qualitative version of isoparametric inequality, which takes into account uh, both the in radius and the out radius uh, of your domain. So actually the version that uh, pops out from this Minkowski inequality is this uh, qualitative version. Okay, but let's see, maybe I can wrap up uh, bring it to maybe a good place. Okay, so I guess I have only uh, two minutes. So hey, this is so this will be the preview of the next talk. Yeah. So uh, right. So what, what are the main points? Right. It's uh, isometric inequality. Right. It's a variational problem. You need to do some variation. Right. You want to do the variation. You get the standard polynomial. So the polynomial is controlled by these the total mean curvatures. So these are the quantities that control how uh, things like volume and surface area change. And so one thing that uh, we were able to show in the first paper that, uh, yes, we actually have a comparison formula uh, for comparing the part mean curvature of a, uh, Region actually, this is the kind of arbitrary region in Riemannian manifold, and the formula actually holds for all Riemannian manifolds, not just the carbon hydrogen spaces. So you have a closed hypersurface, surface, and then you have another hypersurface surface inside, and then you assume that these hypersurfaces surfaces are level sets of some function, and uh, so we can actually compute the difference. And this is an exact formula. Uh, it holds with all Riemannian manifolds, and uh, so this portion of it involves the level sets of the, uh, in th these are the principal curvatures of the level sets of functions, which are five rays from the big region to your small region. So in particular, you know, a lot of times you can fibrate using convex surfaces. So you know exactly what the sign of this thing is. 
and this is the section of curvature of your manifold. So this difference, this term is excellent because you know exactly what the sign of it is. Uh, unfortunately, there's this second term, which is more complicated, and it has the mixed terms in uh, Riemann tensor, and this is a huge pain because uh, the mixed terms of the Riemann tensor, you don't know what their sign is. Even if you have a space of positive curvature, the sectional curvatures are given by R, I, J, I, J, when the indices alternate. But if the indices are mixed, you don't know what the sign of that is. You have no idea. So, so this, uh, this, uh, this equality is useful when you can eliminate this thing. And the way you eliminate is that here is the gradient of your function. When it's the distance function, you know that this is a constant is equal to one. So this formula is very good when you look at the parallel surfaces. Uh, also, these guys drop out when the indices are too few, uh, in which case, and that happens when R equals one. So this formula, one, another one of its uses is that it actually proves the monotonicity for the total mean curvature, which is, uh, which is very good. And then uh, you can prove it in a couple of ways. You can use the divergence of these things that Riley called uh, Newton operators. Uh, there's another proof uh, using uh, Chern's differential forms. And okay, I'm, I'm glad I got to this point. Uh, yes, so um, this, uh, the, the way I learned about these differential forms, there were some uh, papers of uh, Borbelli, who was a student of uh, Fred in uh, Notre Dame. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I did get to a point where I could uh, uh, mention, uh, mention Fred. Uh, and uh, I guess my time is up, so I'll stop here. Time and given that uh, Hannah will be around through the weekend, perhaps we can ask questions individually as, uh, as we grab all of them. Let me uh, make a, a couple of announcements. So I'm not going to you know, continue coming. Uh, just to kind of if you look at the schedule or not, we have dinner uh, for free bird burritos. That's free for everybody next door. That'll be uh, probably about 6 30, and then we have another talk. After that, uh, we have a banquet tomorrow night, which we're covering the speakers, but it's, uh, it's $15 for uh, non-graduate students, $10 for graduate students. Money over here is going to be collecting the money. So if you plan on going, we hope you all are, uh, please see him uh, you know, sometime tonight, maybe between talks right now, between this talk and dinner would be great. So otherwise, uh, we'll see you all at 6.30 next door. I think we have uh, music, Ken, the director, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks for coming, and uh, we'll see you all throughout the weekend. So, thanks. Uh, if you in, in your manifold, you have a fixed volume, and then you have the minimizer of the surface area, do you? Uh, have a good control of situation. Well, actually, actually, it's not even clear that that thing even exists. Uh, I, I think, I, I think uh, okay, so, so sorry, okay, go on. So, anyway, I was just thinking that you did write sort of critical points for surface area. If they would satisfy different equations, then you can restrict to those types of surfaces. Yeah, unfortunately. This minimizes. So actually, there is a paper by uh, Joe Haas that constructs an example where the minimizer is not even connected. It's like more than one piece. And um, and also, question of regularity that you're asking. I think that's also uh, it's not clear. So for instance, actually, one thing that we can show if the minimizer of the total gas Kronecker curvature is a C11, then that finishes. Oh, really? Yes. Oh, well, that's good. Because uh, this comparison formula that I have shown, it shows that if you go in by constant distance, that you look at the inner parallel body, then you always have a monotonicity. So if you have some something that already minimizes, then you go inside by a small distance and it remains constant, 
it means that the curvature terms is going to vanish. So in your in Euclidean space. That's right. So yeah. So it's a good question, but if you can prove regularity of these minimizers, then you're done. Thank you.